So good afternoon everyone um, and a warm welcome to everybody listening. Um, I'm delighted to be moderating a panel today on entrepreneurship in Africa, um, particularly at this time of crisis. Um, and this panel session is part of the In for Africa Alliance, um, which has been curated to respond to the challenges faced by Africa um, in tackling this dreadful pandemic. Today's panel session is a really, really interesting one. Um, entrepreneurs, in my opinion, are really the lead the way in terms of setting the pace for the rest of us in the business world to follow. Um, entrepreneurs are able to adapt, navigate and remain agile in challenging circumstances whilst opening the door to a wealth of opportunities. Africa in particular has been a landing pad for many exciting innovations. We've seen it in the energy sector with um, the pay-as-you-go solar energy schemes that are going on, in mobile banking with the launch of M-Pesa, in e-commerce with the launch of logistics and delivery service Jumia, um, and also in the health service with Mobi Health International, which launched um, a few years ago. Um, and that's just to name a few. Um, Africa is... Um, facing a number of challenges, but equally it's a continent that is ready to rise to those challenges through innovative solutions. So just to give you a bit of background on me, um, I'm the moderator today. Um, my name is Veronica Bolton-Smith. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at a company called Invest Africa based in London. Um, we're a leading business and investment platform connecting over 450 global members to investment opportunities on the continent. I'm also really proud East African and have made it my life's work to support Africa's trade and investment um, opportunities rather. So today I'm joined by two fantastic speakers um, who are both successful entrepreneurs and have made huge strides in connecting Africans to their technology platforms, improving access to a variety of services and therefore improving lives and not to mention the speed at which the business can be done on the continent. So during this panel, we're going to explore how the current landscape is having an impact on entrepreneurs, assess what opportunities are available for entrepreneurs and what role entrepreneurs can play in supporting governments and multilateral organisations. So first up, I'd like to welcome Ama Gyampo. Um, Ama, sorry. Ama is an independent consultant, an entrepreneur at heart, an angel investor, and is currently the co-founder of Scale Up Africa. I'd also like to welcome Emmanuel Gamor, who's the president of Unpacking Africa, which is a podcast platform. Um, and Emmanuel is also co-chair for Impact and Knowledge Council for Global Shapers, which is part of the World Economic Forum. So may I hand over to you both. Uh, first, let's start with Amma, just to introduce yourself and give us a bit of background as to what you do um, and um, some of the challenges perhaps that you've been facing in this uh, current pandemic. Sure, um, I'm a proud returnee, um, happen from London, but lived in Ghana for about eight years now. Um, I work as an independent consultant, as you said, who I advise you know, organizations, foundations, corporations, and SMEs primarily on, on policy issues and how to basically get them to tackle some of the issues to, to operate more efficiently, to find relevant partnerships for distribution and you know, just opportunities for growth, um, generally speaking. I'm also the co-founder of Scale Up Africa, which is really here to kind of assist African entrepreneurs to do better with the growth and maturity conversation. We have a lot of startup conversations, but not much on the, you know, moving the needle towards growth and maturity. So that's kind of like our, our core mission through, you know, um, events and other programs, corporate acceleration programs that, that are really here to kind of delve into some of the opportunities that SMEs can have and offer big business uh, to, to for partnerships and access to innovation and, you know, new technologies that uh, maybe big corporations and other organizations can benefit from. So we're really trying to bridge the gap between SMEs and the big business to, to see how we can create more opportunities and, and really ultimately create the jobs that we need for our 12 million um, you know, African young people getting onto the job market every single year. It's, it's a major challenge and a, a ticking time bomb. In terms of challenges, I mean, you know, everything has changed, as we know. I mean, it's, it's less, more of an understatement than anything, but um, we, we are really here to just give a lot of information. I think that the early... The, the first few um, couple of months were very difficult for everybody, uh, just adjusting mm -hmm. to the shock of what happened. 
we had a lot of uh, SOS kind of outreach from our SME community with people with very little runway, very few reserves, having to let people go literally overnight, you know, in the hospitality sector in particular, um, you know, people just lost all their bookings and livelihood for the, for the year. I mean, it, it, it just, everything just changed. Mm. And so our, our response at Scale Up Africa was to do a series of webinars, just it was called the Survival Series, uh, just for a month uh, to really just, you know, get some of our partners and friends together to, to give some practical tips and advice and support for SMEs across the continent. And we have people dialing from the diaspora as well, but over the course of four weeks, we had about uh, almost a thousand people uh, register and participate in the webinars across a four week period. So that just goes to show the, the amount of uh, support mm -hmm. that people were really needing at that point in time. And so, you know, we're, we're all just, you know, wearing our practical hats. How do you conserve your cash? How do you pivot potentially? How do you partner and collaborate? How do you leverage your relationships? Um, you know, we have, we have hospitality businesses that are at least a 60% occupancy because they've kind of reached out to people within their networks to kind of find ways of partnering with each other. So, I mean, it's not all gloomy. I mean, it's great to see a lot of the innovation that's come up, of course, you know, essential services, health and food. It's been yeah. just amazing to see the volume of uh, solutions and innovations and iterations of existing um, solutions in those spaces to just reach people with information, data, um, tracking, you know, all that kind of stuff that we mm. need to kind of get on top of COVID, but also, you know, with people embracing digital. I mean, it's, it's been, I, th I think I heard on the BBC the other day, it's, you know, in two months, we've moved forward in, in two years uh, in terms of the digital agenda. So uh, it's a massive opportunity for, for Africa, the continent, especially people like Emmanuel, um, people who convene, you know, young people and people like ourselves who work with SMEs. It's, mm. it's really a great time for us to kind of propagate the digital message and to see how we can all leverage that opportunity to make things more efficient from government all the way down to food distribution and to reduce, you know, post-harvest losses, for example, uh, with, with food. Because obviously it's global supply chains have uh, really been frazzled by this situation. That's right. And yeah. so we are, we are going to have to look at um, how to become more self-reliant to reduce our massive import bill um and to break some of those habits and you know go local and and more regional and that's it's a, that's a, the biggest opportunity we have as a collective um you know yeah i'll touch on that later with you i think um the regional question is something that's very interesting at this point particularly when you mention supply chains you know perhaps we'll touch on that later on how we see what we predict will happen there what innovations can take place to sort of enable that to continue or to grow how can people process um, things in in country i think those are really key questions because the global supply chain may not be so reliable um, going forward so um, maybe we'll touch on that a bit later on um, emmanuel would you like to just sort of introduce yourself and um, a bit about what you're doing thank you um, it's a pleasure to be on this platform um, so i currently teach digital and Digital Reputation Management at the University of Stellenbosch. I also do research on management innovation at the University of Esbassistrand Business School. And so I engage with both academics and ecosystem players on ways of kind of looking at innovation as a driver for economic growth on our continent um, and beyond. I, part of my volunteers' uh, activity is what you mentioned. I've been with the World Economic Forum, Global Shapers, for seven years, and I sit on the uh, Council for Impact and Knowledge as co-chair um, and part of what I've also tried to actively do um, I do have a couple of businesses in Ghana. I have an edtech startup here in South Africa where we were incubated at Shimalahong Precinct um, in the digital district in Bromfontein. Um, but what I try to do is also bridge the gap between academia, research and industry and so um, do consulting under the umbrella of unpacking Africa. So it really is unpacking the ecosystems that we've set up, unpacking um, big challenges that we have that need multi-stakeholder engagement, but also need um, kind of multi-throng solution-based interventions. A bit of what Amma spoke about when we talk about digital transformation. Um, mm -hmm. And through that platform, I'm able to also have um, engagement and conversations that are um, kind of foster empathetic listening. There's a lot of what some might call noise or media or specific reports, they don't cut to the heart of what we're dealing with and they're not timely enough to engage um, relevant interventions that are for us, by us, but most importantly, that are 
um, contextualized in a way that we can adopt. And I think that space is, is that's a huge space that we probably need to address. Um, and that's why I'm excited to join campaigns like Info Africa and join some of these webinars so that we can share um, peer learnings as we're having them go on and then we can be more empowered to take and have timely interventions as needed. So thank you. Great, thank you very much. So um, I think we talked about a bit, a, bit, a bit about the challenges that you both faced in your line of work. Um, I'd like to maybe dig into another area which is to, it struck me more recently that Af throughout Africa's history entrepreneurs have really been the lifeblood, the, the driving force for economies and um, Without entrepreneurs, there can be no innovation um, or job creation, as you mentioned, Emma, which is really vital at this point in time, as you mentioned, the ticking time bomb um, in Africa um, with a huge growth in um, youth population. So what do entrepreneurs in Africa bring to the table that say perhaps a multinational can't? Um, and what do you foresee as some of the challenges and opportunity that will face Africa's entrepreneurs? And let's start with Emma. Yeah, I mean, you know, small is beautiful in this case, right? Like being agile, being nimble, being able, able to innovate and create things very quickly. You know, your, 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 your reporting structure is very flat, so you can just, what we, we're finding people just creating new solutions just literally uh, within days and, and going to market within days. That is what entrepreneurs, especially in the tech and innovation space, can bring. And I, I think there's a huge opportunity, and I've been talking about this for several years now, but there is a huge opportunity for big business to do a lot more with small business. Yeah. not just you know the startup and pitching conversations it's really about how do you get um, more smes with into your supply chains how do you even make yourself yourselves accessible to smes that might complement what you're offering strategically as well as in the short term you know there are a lot of things that can be done in that way to build those relationships yeah. and bridges because obviously smes will you know most of them will fail we, you know we, we know the statistics i think everyone realizes that you know most smes globally will fail within within two years for various reasons. Poor business models, the wrong idea, um, poor market strategy or, or, or scaling strategy. That, that's just a fact of life. But you know, I think, I think in terms of that kind of relationship building and finding ways to open up distribution channels for SMEs that are nimble and agile and align strategically with objectives, I mean, that, that's where the potential is. And I think we should have more of those kinds of conversations. And you mentioned that you sort of um, offer some of these companies advice, particularly around the pandemic. So when things really shut down very rapidly, what were the main questions that came out of the, the support that you were offering them via the webinars? Um, and, and what we, yeah. you know, what tangible advice could you offer them um, given that this is a brand new sort of situation we find ourselves in? Yeah, I think, I think the primary thing was obviously cash, you know, the reserves yeah. and, and the lack of runway. I mean, that, that was overwhelmingly the issue. You know, people were looking for loans and emergency funding and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and so that, that was the primary thing. And obviously, you know, we, we, we had to give the, the, the key piece of uh, advice we gave was to look for partnerships or collaborative opportunities, figure out how you could repurpose your current assets. So if you, whatever it is you have, how can you maybe serve a different market altogether or how can you deliver in, a, in an innovative way that maybe wasn't your target before. Um, so with hospitality, you know, a lot, of them have, a lot of them have had to switch to maybe more domestic marketing tactics mm -hmm. compared to maybe initially where they were on the Airbnbs and stuff, booking.coms, which have all dried up. Yeah. And so it, it's really to just open up the mind beyond the shock. It's kind of like, how do you communicate with your staff as well? You know, how yeah. do you, if you have to let people go or, you know, what kind of conversations are you going to have to have with your, your staff and being more open uh, to communicate because, you know, I think there's a culture of being the boss or the big, the big mm. or gal, or the big madame. And, you know, a lot of people were putting pressure on themselves because they thought they had to just fix the problem, which, you know, everyone was experiencing. So it was really about just coaching people to be more transparent with their staff, explain what's happening and do their very best to maybe look after them and keep them on as much as it was possible, you know. Uh, and yeah. then obviously conserving cash as well, just conserving your cash and, and being very mindful of your costs and stuff like that. But I, I find that now we're in May, end of May. I think the conversation has shifted towards more progressive solutions. What can be done looking forward? People are looking forward now um, to what is possible. And obviously digital is, is, is at the forefront of that, as well as the free trade agreement, which everyone is kind of um, looking to as well, which has been interesting to, to see the, the change and the switch in, in uh, perspective from the community now. 
Yeah, great. And Emmanuel, obviously with your podcast, um, looking at sort of ecosystems, as you mentioned in more detail, um, how have you found the listeners adapting to perhaps new topics that you're offering? Are you looking at things like the um, what's coming out of um, the AFRIXIM and African Union with the African Continental Free Trade Agreement and really trying to unpick that for people? Because there is so much there um, and perhaps entrepreneurs in particular aren't sure how they can access um, information, finances from, from organizations such as those. So have you found that listeners are asking particular types of questions? Are they, are they more engaged in certain topics? Um, so thanks. Um, in terms of, so I'll, I'll dial it back a bit. Um, part of the World Economic Forum's mantra also is in engaging and having an agenda for shaping. And I think the just before the ratification of the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, we've been looking and interrogating in, at ways in which not just regional blocks, but different stakeholders, including young people, can be empowered. So the conversation has been preceding the podcast and it's been preceding that, that specific kind of dialogue platform. It's been, how do we find ways that we can have sustainable development? How do we engage Africa's youngest uh, kind of like dividend demographic of young people and meaningful work so that then the future casting isn't aid based the future casting for the Africa we want to see doesn't depend on political swings or different mm -hmm. formats but also then the type of world that we get to see our kids grow up is also built based on our own indigenous local practices so part of what I do with the research at Vince Business School is looking and highlighting local innovation in that space um, because innovation then needs funding, um, part of what we've also looked at, and it comes from an economic growth theory, is how then do we create liberalized trade um, and what mm. type of trade liberalization of goods and services across a, a large geographic mass as the African continent makes most sense. So part of the research has also been when we have co-working spaces, when we have SMEs, entrepreneurs, um, when we have international programs, whether from DFID, USAID, whether uh, from UK, from um, GIZ and what have you, what ecosystem does it plug into for engagement? Mm -hmm. And so that type of conversation has been happening in multiple different spaces, um, but also then looking at what type of entrepreneurs are young people able to become? Is it a lifestyle? Is it something that's able to scale up? Is it something that is for acquisition? What are those type of policies? Those conversations I've been able to have in campuses at various, and I mentioned Jamal Hong Precinct, Impact Hub, co-working spaces have that. Um, but speaking specifically of the podcast, it's one of the things that the pandemic has done is it slowed everybody down. So what we've all started to do now, and those statistics have shown uptake in podcast listening because a lot of the mainstream media then tend to prioritize things that seem to be either health related or um, communicate that's coming from the political sector. And a lot of things like what are innovative practices that possibly haven't been tested out, but can be scaled are lost in the fray because they're urgent announcements that need to go through. So if you're listening to your local news cycle, wherever you're at, and particularly I'm sure for you, the international news cycle, you're hearing very little of what's happening on the ground from your home country, mm -hmm. from a continent, you're hearing very little from, and it's little things like what are logistics? How are people getting food to other places from urban to rural areas? Um, how are people able to take care of others within these constraints where you have migration of people across a continent where, whether it's a SADC region, you're having different people from different countries moving in and out and can no longer do so, but have to survive. So the podcast in itself doesn't address uh, Afriaxin Bank and specifically um, the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, and there are two reasons. Um, it's set up so that people can hear what interventions entrepreneurs are having so that that can be part of the missing conversation on the global front and in our media outlets. But the second part is the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement is supposed to have been operationalized in June with the Secretariat mm -hmm. being in Ghana. So yes, there's the, um, the chair, Wamle um, Mekmeme, uh, who is from South Africa, but he has to, he's been, well, he's working out of Ethiopia and Addis now, because even though it's been ratified, the operationalization, the uh, monitoring and evaluation, um, the competitive policies that need to go into effect now, things like 
making sure that rules of origin are being enforced because we have a, a lockdown, we're not seeing those types of activities. So it's one of those things where when the engines start to grind, then you start to get people give feedback. In terms of discussions around it, there are two things. One, I think the pandemic is great in letting people understand that we need community sustainability policies. So because we've had such interruptions with how we trade and because typically our intertrade is less than 15%, typically on the global scale, we're doing less than 5% global trade. A lot of our dependencies are if we're engaging with the United States, we're engaging with the UK, with the Brexit, there's a lot of distractions. So this pause is giving us time to say, well, with 50 plus states, we've had this uh, single market that has been the brainchild of the Abuja, Abuja Treaty from 1992 for such a long time, it's been expedited. How then do we look at things that still need to be, to be negotiated? Um, compet the competitiveness, how does that happen between countries, their Francophone countries, their Anglophone, mm -hmm. their Lusophone countries, but also most importantly, the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement is hinged on regional lessons learned. So when we're taking ECOWAS, East African region, we're looking at SEDAC, what are the lessons that they've had in liberalizing trade and market practices? Then how do we unearth those in a way that takes into consideration both the formal and what maybe the other global economies would consider informal economies? Mm -hmm. um, on that front, there's a bit of encouragement, um, but also I think the other narrative that I'm hearing, and, and it seeps a little bit into the podcast as well, is when we have this pandemic that we don't know when um, the cure is going to happen, uh, business practices are being changed, um, probably irreversibly, the way we, we, we see things now. And it's not going to, we're not, we're not ever going to go into the pre-pandemic era again. Mm. Uh, it, it's a new way of doing things. Then we also are asking ourselves, how do we have things like healthcare, um, logistic chains within communities so that when these things happen, we don't have a, a, another wave of poverty pandemic that is be, be beyond just the health repercussions. So those are the discussions that are happening. I think that um, people still don't see necessarily the, the impact, obviously, of the continental free trade because it's not um, in operation yet. There's a lot of push that from some finance ministers, some investors as well on the continent to speed it up because we see it as one of the ways in which we can kind of accelerate um, African economies because the global economy is also struggling. Um, it's, it's not just us going through this and we recognize that we will not be priority for others whilst other economies across the world are going through and dealing with the virus. Yeah, thanks very much, Emmanuel. A lot of information there to digest, but I think something that has come out of the conversation from both of you today is that actually what we're seeing is um, Africa has this huge youth population and, you know, in the coming years, if, if they don't have jobs, it's going to create issues. Um, the pandemic may actually create in, op, new opportunities for this uh, cohort and especially around the whole digital platforms that you've mentioned. Um, and But I wonder what that means for the older generation. I, I think of people like my father who doesn't even understand what Facebook means. Um, and, you know, ha will there be this bigger divide between, you know, these two big cohorts? Or do you think that it will be embraced by some of the older generation who, you know, some of them are leading big law firms and, and the rest of it? You know, how do you see them playing in, in this new world, if you like, Emma? Yeah, I think I think young people, whatever young means nowadays, I mean, yeah. you know, 40s, 40s and you 20, I'm told. Uh, I'm not sure about that, but anyway, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. But I mean, you know, the the younger generation or the digital generation. I'm, I'm not even sure if it's X, Y, or Z nowadays. I'm just so confused <laughs> with the with the terminologies. But the generational gap is going to be there. The digital divide is already there in terms of access and affordability. That's already a thing. I mean, my mum is very good online. She gives me the news, up to date news reels. Like whenever I call, it's like she give me the breaking news that she's been, you know, she's seen on some website somewhere. So, I mean, not everyone is there and that's, that's mm -hmm. going to be fine. But I think we will have to make it easier for them to access those services and show them how. I mean, that's going to, you know, if my mom can't, the first time she used Uber, I'm the one who set it up on her phone. Yeah. And now she can call an Uber, right? Mm -hmm. So these are practical things that are going to happen anyway. I mean, it's, that, that's what, you know, intergenerational uh, relationships are, are meant to be about. You know, the new wave comes through, new ways of doing things come through, and then you kind of hold your hand, the hands of the older generation to be able to at least somehow function within the new realm, right? So this this is an opportunity for us. I think the timing is just amazing. Like Emmanuel said, it's a pause, 
but we need to take advantage of the pause and as, as everyone keeps saying you know not to waste the opportunity of the crisis mm -hmm. uh, we, we need to get very serious about you know our education system you know the quality of teaching and facilities and infrastructure and all these things that we've been talking about with with health being the first one that was exposed by covid yeah. i mean every single area is ripe for disruption you know mm -hmm. food waste is a massive problem across the continent i think we throw away something like 40 percent of the food that we harvest wow. meanwhile we're, we're importing so so much i forget the figures it's 60 billion I, I forget the food bill but like we import so much into the continent we waste so much on the continent there's a lot of scope to innovate in that space to make it more um like I said earlier, you know, more local markets, more yeah. local distribution, really thinking about logistics on the ground. You know, we know that the road networks are not that great, but given what we're working with, you know, what can we do with what we've got? And I think it really is, is from starting from those kinds of basics before we think about the super highways across the continent and all those kinds of things, which will be discussed and discussed. And, you know, there will be politicians and people at, around the table signing these big deals. But how do we deal with what we've got on the ground? to make it easy for someone to pick up a phone and call a doctor or have a consultation by Skype, um, I mean, which of course, yeah. you know, we've seen an uptake in, you know, these are all opportunities. So we need to get very serious about, about how to really tap into that and bring everybody into, into that kind of conversation and that experience. I think the logistics sector is particularly interesting. And like you say, Africa's not made of the best roads or even enough roads or railway, but yeah. clearly, people like Coca-Cola have managed it and they've managed it for such a long period, right? So it's yeah. about learning from what's already been done, perhaps adapting to those situations. Partnering, I think, is going to be a key thing going forward for entrepreneurs and the business world in Africa. So, um, yeah, I, I really take to what you're saying there. I think there's um, there are plenty of opportunities um, out there um, and we just need to look at how we can adapt. And Emmanuel, um, have you got anything to add to, to that? Uh, absolutely. I'm definitely a huge advocate for information sharing. And I think that like a low hanging fruit is digital transformation in the way that we see it. Um, I do push mo for, for it to be a lot further than, than we think. Um, two reasons. One, digital transformation and, and the way that we engage with it on the continent is as consumers. We're not creating, we're not coding, we're not. Right. So a lot of... Uh, the training that we're doing is really telling people to become digitally competent on an already established platform. That being said, um, there's also a fear that as we continue to socialize our people on a platform that we don't own, we're starting to create a new generation of people who will be paying rent on e-commerce sites. And so if you are, again, and that's what I was sharing with part of our research on management, um, where there's a lot of pause because even with anti-competitive laws, um, Amazon still rules. So when you have mm. such practices that you have these dominance, too big to fail, um, can kind of manipulate the market because their platform is what they have and then they can they can kind of bully uh, nations, smaller mom and pop stores that need their platform to thrive, then we're actually putting a, a huge chunk of our already um, vulnerable group of people on the continent into a space that um, almost anybody globally can take advantage of. So there's a lot of, there's, there's a bit of things through that should go into our digital transformation. Um, but it obviously starts from getting as many of us digitally competent, engaged, asking the right questions as much as possible. That also speaks to infrastructure and communities. Typically, we've been able to um, prioritize infrastructure in the capital cities. And the pandemic has just shown us how it doesn't matter what way you're at in the world, you, we need to have at least minimally sustainable communities, and especially on the continent because the disparities are so large. Mm -hmm. So when now we're, have, we're having negotiations about where's water, where's healthcare, where are our health students? We're looking at those who, who can actually deliver health interventions. What, are they able to do that outside of um, the urban and capital cities as well? Because we need that. The education, is that also being able to reach out? So how do we to leverage some of these opportunities and technologies and others in order to prioritize that? Economic activity, do we have economic reports that help folks who are in uh, Kano, um, who are in Bolgatanga, who are probably in Mpumalanga, just as much as we do for those in Santon, in Accra and Lagos, we do not. So that type of thinking 
is what we need to be doing because that's what empowers the transformation we need. Um, but also then it, it helps us find out new ways of doing things that we've probably ignored because we've put, we've put such a large priority on just connectivity in certain spaces. Um, part of what was also really interesting is that, and, and we believe that, that innovation is everywhere. It's just the capital markets um, in specific spaces that are able to invest in that. So we are innovative because we have a lot of folks on the continent that are survivalists. Um, our continent is the one that really, if you're talking about conservation practices and others, because we have minimum resources, we're not here contributing majorly to the carbon footprint. <laughs> we're actually selling that with national policy and others. But none of these innovations, whether it's um, clay-made pots that have cooling uh, uh, properties that people are using outside of cities, are being adopted into even our own capital cities and ways of practicing. So I think what Yes, there's a, there's a great need for us to get as many folks thinking about digital or thinking about agile tools and letting digital work for us on the continent. Mm -hmm. But there should be also a priority of ways in which we've lived sustainably with minimal resources now being scaled and adopted both at the city level, at the national level, and at the continental wide level. Then that way, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement first benefits indigenous African innovation and doesn't just become a, um, a gateway for, for exporting other people's cultural tools of right. which we still have to learn anyways and would be at a disadvantage because we pay premium for added value. Yeah, that's uh, that's really important. That last point. Um, I'm also interested to think. To, we talked about sort of how um, the pandemic is is making people think differently, and I wonder for entrepreneurs what space there is for them to collaborate. We mentioned with multilaterals, but um, obviously the government has a bigger part to play. The government's in making sure that their citizens have access to healthcare um, and the rest of it, but. Um, what what role can the entrepreneurs play in making sure that um, the businesses and the multilaterals are ensuring that we have that sorry that Africans are able to um, trade once we open up again trade more um, outside of the the blocks if if that makes sense sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm you I, mind I, if I go for this? Yeah, oh, go for it. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say this is, sounds like an Emmanuel question. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I think we're starting to do that. So the reason Emma and I are engaged is because um, we're starting to kind of create maps and partnerships. So advocacy is really the way it works, right? Governments serve us. And I think that a lot of priority has been put on the continent about why aren't your government negotiating and creating these spaces? Um, the, part of the argument is that the government sh is, is not going to do anything. It's not pressured to do it. So as businesses, as groups, we need to be really putting pressure groups and advocating, um, submitting policies that are favorable for us because by and large, the politicians would not know what are the best things for creating that. They would, they would require associations, they would require, and if, if it's in the, um, possibly in the States, there are a lot of these think tanks, there are a lot of these lobbyist groups and they're mm -hmm. specific. So like the professor that, 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 um, shares a lot of the information on, on America's system of innovation, of innovation. He used to be a lobbyist in the Senate and his job was to articulate to politicians, what is the cycle of education? How many researchers are needed? How many folks in industry? How, how would that translate to research and development and patenting? I think for us on the continent, we seem to be a little more scattered and we don't prioritize the advocacy collectively as entrepreneurs. So we have individual beacons of entrepreneurs. We mm -hmm. have a collective base of entrepreneurs, but we don't prioritize the lobbying and policy think tanks. Um, that helps translate a lot of what we need um, as a business, as local businesses um, to government. I think a lot more consulting firms, whether it's your McKinsey Report, whether it's your World Economic Forum, um, these folks are intentional about this. So they are, they are the ones at these conferences, they are the ones submitting reports, et cetera. They're the ones um, creating an agenda that favors based on what their research is. Uh, but it seems as if we don't have a stronger link with our local academia, whether it's our, um, universities from tech, math and science, where there's our, our industry folks from Tema, which was built to be an industry. I'm yet to read a report um, from Ghana's industry. Tema was built to be the industrialized um, center. I'm yet to re read a report from the businesses from Tema to advise the government and say, hey, we've moved into different industrialization. This is how we see whether the advent of fourth industrial revolution or digital transformation impacting us. These are the policies. 
than to have a pressure group. So that cycle has right. worked in other, in other countries, has worked in other spheres. Um, we seem to be a little behind on doing that. I, I typically have moved away from entrusting politicians and governments to be the be all end all. It's an exasperating practice. Um, and to be honest, <laughs> most of the people who are government Which is why the entrepreneurs exist, surely, because they've found a way around <laughs> the red tape, perhaps. Yeah, I, but I think that we have a unique type of political infrastructure on the continent. Most of the folks who are now in the government space are, are folks who um, used to, or fought for independence or are directly linked to it. There's an intrinsic almost feeling of ownership to the leadership yeah. position rather than being um, economists or being part of economies in a way that they understand that um, these policies then can build structures that benefit a wider scope of folks. So no matter how qualified a lot of these politicians come into it, you find out that this seems to be a disconnect uh, and, and continued agenda, which so they might they might have a manifesto that's great for SMEs, but when you go into the details, it's lacking. And so yeah. you realize that, that that gap needs to be filled quickly by an advocating business class um, with researchers, with implementers, with young people, with innovators to fill in because otherwise then the policies that they're they're that are being, um, or the good intentions that are supposed to be policies never get realized. Right, so from what I'm hearing from you, there's a big shout out there um, and a gap to be filled by these um, business schools and, and um, specific training colleges. So, I mean, Africa's made up of so many of them. There's uh, the um, science- Business and associations, local in chambers Ghana. of commerce, associations. Right, there's, there's napkins in, in, in Nigeria, the engineering school. There's uh, Strathmore in Kenya looking at energy and climate change. I mean, it's made up of many, but I think you're right. This is the time now that they really need to galvanize and start coming out with um, some papers um, and, and really shaping their future, you know? Um, great. And um, Amma, I know that we talked earlier a little bit about um, your impact investing role and angel investing. So from your point of view, where do you see an entrepreneur's getting financing from um, during this pandemic and on after it? Um, the shape, the, the, the uh, landscape for financing is, is probably going to be a little bit different. Um, so, you know, typically you'd have your VCs, your private equity, but do you think that's going to be a little bit more cautious now or will um, as many of the um, indigenous companies that I've come across in the SME space, some of them where they've not been able to access financing from banks or from private equity have actually gone around with uh, their own families to, to gather money and, and, and sort of put that into the business. So how do you see that landscape changing or do you think it will remain the same? Do you think... Um, financing will be more cautious or will they be readily available, ready to sort of pounce on some of these really interesting businesses that are coming to the fore? Yeah, I mean, you know, I was on a call a couple of weeks ago and uh, there's someone from Europe saying how much trouble Africa, Africa was going to be in and it will, you know, um, all, all the, all the money is going to dry up and Africa's, you know, poor Africa. But I'm like, look, people are investing. I have colleagues who are investors from all across the continent, outside the continent actively investing in technology and innovation it's happening i mean deals are being signed as we speak so it's not i don't think it's as bad as you know uh you you know the media would have us think or certain narratives would have us think that's the first point i think i think definitely you know the customer is your best investor you know like in terms of finding a market need and filling that market at a price point that is attractive and accessible to a good enough um, audience. So I think I think that's what investors are going to be looking for: real solutions to real problems, mm. having evidence of that, and putting their mouth money where 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 you know your 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 maybe your initial uh, pilot or your initial seed round has been able to demonstrate. Uh, definitely, you know, money is going to be a bit tight. I mean, you know, it's a global depression we're looking at, not even a recession. We are looking at a fundamental economic uh, shutdown of some sort, you know, it's, it's going to be massive. No, there's no doubt about that. And so obviously money is not going to be easy to come by in terms of external funding. And, you know, everyone's going to be extra cautious. The due diligence is going to be extra, extra stringent in terms of, you know, justifying any, any potential investment that's going to come into a company. So I, I think, you know, it, it's not all bleak, but I think entrepreneurs are going to have to step up to the plate and really prove their business models are super, super, super compelling for investors to even be interested in, in having a look at the company. And obviously, 
we talk about the usual systems and processes and technologies to make sure that you know any company that's looking for external investment is actually ready to scale do they have the infrastructure to scale you know if they're, if they're tech reliant what kind of systems are they, you know, is it a cloud system? Is it their own system? Is it a proprietary software? You know, if they're going to scale, are they using, let's say, you know, radio is very popular in Africa in terms of scale, you know, reaching yeah. a mass market. Radio is old school, but it works, you know, in terms of reaching people and educating people about potential solution or services that you're offering as a company. So entrepreneurs are going to have to get a lot more um, creative and market aware. Uh, and if, you know, in the best scenario, become market creators of, of something totally new. So I think that's where we sit right now. But um, it, it's, it's um, I keep calling myself an Af Afro-optimist. I really am. I mean, sometimes I, I might sound a bit uh, <laughs> naive, but I, I see so many encouraging things happening, like literally on the ground. It's, it's, they're just far too many fantastic think, things happening right now that, you know, I can't, I can't be um, negative. Otherwise, about no, I, I have to agree with you because, okay, I'm based in the UK here, but I travel to the, to, to, um, Africa quite frequently and also have my family there but for me this this conversation around you know Africa's going to suffer it's seen you know so much um, it's, it's had it's received so many challenges in terms of the Ebola crisis and HIV um, when that was a, a, around in the 80s and 90s um, in a big way and and now with this COVID-19 and are they ready do they have water to wash their hands you know of all these questions that are coming up and I keep on saying but business is still going on you know people are still on the you know basically still working and it, nothing has actually stopped People are still carrying on. And I think we need to share those stories. And especially that you guys who are, you know, really there, um, you know, I think it's important for us to continue with this conversation and ensuring that we're getting the right message across about what's going on in Africa. And actually, although we mentioned this ticking time bomb with the youth um, cohort, actually, that's also a shining light for the continent, I'd say, because clearly having such a young population is is a perhaps a reason why COVID-19 hasn't had such a huge impact on the continent so um you know I think a lot of those predictions that came around a few weeks ago perhaps even a few months ago um haven't really borne any fruit from what I can tell um and I also remain positive about what's in store for the continent um yeah so um, i just wanted to also um we talked about financing um, emmanuel i don't know if you wanted to add anything to that to, to what amma was mentioning about you know entrepreneurs having to be more agile and how they access finance and, and be a bit more innovative have you have you got any anything to add there yeah briefly um my perspective is more around venture capitalists so there's a, a group of for africa by africa venture capitalists um, and the discussion has also been around the culture of now whittling down the bare bones, the companies and the portfolios that are available now, you know, are needed. So the businesses that are weathering through these storms now are critical. So health uh, yeah. portfolios, good logistics, et cetera. Because I think we get into the place where it was like a lot of um, VC firms and folks were doing things that were sexy or moonshot. And quite a lot of times you're looking at it, you're like, really, are you really investing this because of X, Y, Z? Some sentimental value is coming through. Yeah. So I think the other byproduct is that it's it's cut off a lot of the fat on, on some kind of conjectures that we didn't need. Um, but also it's also going to hopefully let a lot more people be bold in understanding that the infrastructural investments are still needed. Yes, we'd love to have balloons that are up in the sky, et cetera, but really cables for internet, um, for fiber might be what the money should have been going to in the first place. So there's a recalibration of essence and priority. Um, and in the VC community, when a few of the top VCs start to move, there's almost like a, a swoosh of funding that follows. So this recalibration of that funding now um, should be focused on infrastructure, um, foundational investments. So entrepreneurs, as ourselves also should recalibrate. It's great to thought through some of these esoteric, maybe nice to haves, but the truth of the matter is um, our focus should, should have been and now is on the infrastructural things. So we should be solving problems that are basic infrastructure. Then on top of that, we can innovate and compete. Yeah, I, I have to agree with you. Yeah, yeah essential exactly. services. I mean, you know, internet is a utility now, right? It's not like an optional thing. We, everybody needs water, everybody needs gas, everyone needs electricity, everybody needs internet. Yeah fundamentals and essentials and I think that's really what I'm seeing as well in terms of just the, the switch in focus 
So really governments and uh, multilaterals need to focus on those key things because without electricity, for example, I mean, nothing else will work. So it's a fundamental in access to water, clean water. Um, so yeah, I agree with you there. I think without those uh, foundations being met, then it's going to be hard for anything else really to, to come out of that. I, I just, I wanted to say something. So I think when we say electricity and water, there's also a narrative that makes it seem as if that's, it's, it's fundamentals in thinking, for example, interlocability. So yes, we have things like SMS and we have mobile phones, mm -hmm. but it's still incredibly difficult because of multiple currencies and finance structures that are colonially inherited for us to transfer money within the continent. So when, when I say basics, I don't mean like development world like nets and malaria and health basics. I mean basics like economic fundamentals. Um, if I'm an entrepreneur and I want to take advantage of um, logistics, I need to be able to trust that my goods can be transported in a trustworthy, safe space without fluctuating tariffs across borders, but yeah. also like the, the payment form for my customers in other countries goes through an institution of trust and mm -hmm. is not impacted by the fluctuation of currencies. Those type of, so those are, they're not necessarily simple, but those are fundamentals that we've kind of like skipped. And, and before the pandemic, we were all imagining all these other mm -hmm. things, like having these lion den competitions, but you're like, wait a minute, these, these fundamentals need to be addressed so that then these nice to haves are yeah. built on top of that. Yeah, that's very true. Um, I, I see we're coming up to the to the end of the session, but um, before we, we end, I just wanted to, um, two more questions. One was, um, have you seen any success stories that have come out of this period? Um, any interesting businesses that you've seen come to the fore? Um, yeah, so that's my first question, and then I'll, I'll end with the last one. Um, yeah, Anna, loads. Okay. So many examples. Pick, I mean, pick, I think we, pick your, first, your top two. Oh my, uh, I would definitely have to shout out M Pharma. I mean, they, they've been yeah. amazing in terms of just yeah. scaling the business, the right partnerships, the right advisors, obviously securing 17 million recently, uh, and just really just, you know, just the logistics uh, part of their operation has just been phenomenal in this time. And I think um, Incas Diagnostic as well, also from Ghana, both from Ghana, um, not biased at all. Oh yeah, um, whatever. <laughs> but you know, Incas is a wholesale provider of diagnostic kits. I mean, they've done so many interesting things around diagnostic kits, um, and they've done really well as well with a with a rapid test for for um, COVID. But you know, amongst others in their in their arsenal of uh, you know diagnostic kits, which are affordable and accessible. So yeah, just a lot a lot going on. Especially, of course, health tech is has been huge because of the times we're yeah. in, obviously. Yeah. Uh, but I'd, I'd definitely love to see more um, in terms of food and distribution logistics because there's a lot there's a lot can, that can be disrupted in that space to to kind of make our, our food distribution um, a lot more uh, efficient and you know addressing food security issues across the continent. So that that's still a massive opportunity. But we're seeing the likes of you know Farmer Line and others do amazing things as well. And in Ghana, just to touch on yeah. what we talked about earlier, just um, Emma, we we talked about um, you know ensuring that th these regional blocks are able to um, not import so much and focus on homegrown processed um, uh, sectors so processing rather so uh, manufacturing and agro processing etc so in Ghana where you're based right now what where do you see what sectors do you see um, able to sort of carry that out um, and and do you think anything might come online anytime soon in terms of processing capacity. yeah just to ensure that you know they're not having to import or i guess yeah, i mean that yeah i you know emmanuel just spoke to the fact that you know there are a lot of complex issues we need to deal with you know mm. unfortunately you know competitiveness and productivity and also human capital in terms of technical expertise are still challenges on the continent so we need to tackle those things as well those three things being yeah. more productive having a better quality of technical expertise on the continent of which we have many amazing people in terms yes. of food science and all that kind of stuff and then you know the, the fundamental structural stuff like in terms of, you know the price of um you know the cost of, of farming the cost of farming inputs um you know compared to somewhere like america you know so how, how do we deal with those structural issues which are very complex Mm. Uh, I can't I can't pretend to to have all the answers to, to those fundamental things but I'm hoping that the free trade agreement and agreement and the, the discussions around that will really tackle some of the fundamental legacy issues that we have as in terms of systems because if, if you know it's gonna it's, it's the fundamental issue is that it's cheaper sometimes you know all these imports that we're having 
it you know landed on the shelf or on the, in the marketplace it still end up cheaper than something that's produced locally yeah do you understand so yeah, yeah, yeah. that is a fundamental fundamental issue yeah, sure. i can buy a box of chicken in accra you know um for a lot cheaper than i can get one whole dressed chicken that's locally made I remember this being something that President Kagame of Rwanda mentioning that is part of the reason why he stopped the imports of secondhand clothes because in the end, you know, it was right, right. the garment industry. The, yeah, yeah, so the local garment industry. Yeah. Correct. So these so are a lot of bold moves that need to be yeah. made. I mean, serious decisions on a systemic level. You know, there's yeah. no point in having all these. Uh, we're talking about agriculture, but the cost of production and the competitiveness and the technical skills mm. are not quite there. You know, so mm. then it makes us less competitive. So we mm. need to tackle those issues seriously if we're, if we're going to make a, you know, a dent in, you know, consuming what we can and, uh, you know, processing what we can't to extend the, yeah. the shelf life and, and distribution opportunities as well. And now we have the time to do it. So uh, we need to get our thinking caps on. Hopefully and we get it done. these questions to the people concerned. In partnership. Correct. Yeah. Um, and Emmanuel, the same question to you, really. What would be your top two uh, companies that you've seen come out of um, this period of pandemic? So the first, and I think it was less to do with specific companies, but it was more industry. And okay. that would tie into, um, I think, the comment about President Kagame and um, secondhand foreign clothes and garments. Mm -hmm. So because of the AGOA, um, Africa Growth and Opportunity Act, um, which was supposed to be bilateral trade agreements and allowing us to trade with the United States, um, a lot of trade was kind of not in our favor on manufacturing and on textiles. What we've seen is a lot of local um, kind of textile makers, fashion, whatever you call them, are coming up with these masks that are local. So you're mm -hmm. seeing that like here in South Africa, President Ramaphosa had on and it was a meme trending, having all these local prints in Ankara. So it's, it's one, it's, it's just social resilience because it is difficult. Like nobody's here spending beyond necessities. We don't know what time it's, um, the, the pandemic would either slow down or economic activity would come back. But that, the fact that local textile and garment manufacturers are able to make masks that represent Ankara and it's taken on in our communities, it allows. So there are quite a number of um, folks on that platform trying to do well. The second industry that is really interesting and hopefully we highlight that a bit more um, have to do with kitchens and food places that are distributing not just um, for folks within their communities, but also for a lot of the uh, um, healthcare providers, so nurses, so organizations that are donating and trying to make sure that healthcare, because for countries under lockdown and we started to see the ease, folks who are um, doctors, ER, nurses, et cetera, um, don't have time to be cooking for themselves, don't have the same amount of freedom that we do being at home. So it's been quite a number of um, interventions coming from community kitchens, from NGOs helping mm -hmm. to deliver. And we've seen that also start to expand to um, communities that have um, either the elderly folks um, or communities that have um, folks that may not be able to, to sustain themselves. And, and these could be some of either the shanty towns or, or the rural areas as well. So these two places, industries have, are really kind of like the unsung key I don't know if there's a specific brand or company that's been on them, um, but that also speaks to a little bit about what recalibrating should look like. There should be no reason why in from 2021 onwards, there is a sustaining food network between what we normally are able to grow and feed ourselves. Um, mm. So a lot of the, the broken chicken and um, kind of access to local chicken analogy comes from legacy policies that the government has done in bilateral trade with China that allows the dumping of these things. So now every country is going to be thinking a bit more nationalistic than they should. Uh, but that gives us pause for us to justify and look back at some of these um, legacy kind of policies that we had that allowed um, the destruction of local local um, daco farms, for example, having chicken for years. Mm -hmm. But once you have that, that policy of bilateral trade, it, it seeps not just into um, infrastructure development, but also things like um, locally manufactured goods. So we got to recalibrate that. And also, um, and this is my last point on it, um, it's, been a, it's been something that's been a pain point in innovation management that it hasn't service, surfaced, is, is just entrepreneurial um, policy makers. So understanding that some of these policies were good for a set amount of time and letting them expire. And mm -hmm. a lot of our trade bilateral policies seem to, to need to have expired. And this has been almost the, the moment for us to look around and say, 
by golly, we should, we, we are able to create more sustainable food for ourselves. We're able yeah. to create things, but we need to give our local industry a chance to create that. Then the price competition would, would kick in. But if we don't give them that advantage and we always go for what is the um, cheapest price for getting a good, then we're going to be swept out. And then when God forbid another incident like this happens, we're still done. We're still dependent on others because we didn't build our local sustainability model. Yeah. Great. Um, so I'm seeing that the time is, is quickly running away from us. Um, a parting uh, comment from, from both of you, advice for an entrepreneur watching this now. Um, what would you say to them um, if they're looking for a, a nugget of, of wisdom? Um, Amma, you first. Sure. I think just look around, you know, look around and analyze what is going on in your locality. I think local is going to be the, the biggest opportunity for, for people um looking to start something or change direction there are a lot of inefficiencies around uh, i keep saying you know the basics food health education um financial services these are all opportunities that are ripe for disruption or someone to do something a bit different a bit more efficient a bit more you know um helpful in terms of logistics and and um distribution and kind of recalibrating specific situations so I think you know keep it local keep it essential look around analyze and see how you can plug in to to serve uh, your your community and I think you know we, we do need to get very serious about being more self-reliant local is on a dirty word I mean you know all mm -hmm. across the globe a lot more people are paying a lot premium money for locally sourced products you know mm -hmm. you know where your fish has come from you know where your, your, your meat's come from coming from seasonal vegetables i mean these are things that you know people aspire to and pay top dollar for abroad so i think we as africans need to be a lot more mindful of who we are what we have and how to you know conserve and and you know promote and create opportunities for ourselves genuinely it's not, it's not, it, yeah Correct. genuinely it's not it's not isolationist speak uh, it's it's just something that you know if we need to get very serious about it's just it just makes sense well so, i know Things improve from having to source everything so locally. So yeah. it's, it's a positive thing. I mean, I'm looking. It's not at, half bad, is it? Yeah. Not at all. I had, no, not I at had all. a nice uh, delivery done this morning, full of greens, like kale, spinach, basil, rosemary right. from my local farm. Five I'm eating more fruit and veg. This is yeah, yeah exactly. I'm not really so proud. Yeah. It's great, yeah. So we need to support those, support local, Absolutely. and look around. And you know, there are opportunities everywhere. I mean, you know, it's yeah. not easy, but you need to just keep your mind open and uh, you know, find find an analytical yeah. way to to plug into the value chains that are around. Yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you, Emma. And Emmanuel, same to you. Thank you, um, Veronica. Uh, the first one has to do with, I think there's, there's a wave of anti-academic or anti-thinking or rigor or challenging. I think that a lot of folks who are doing entrepreneurs are kind of anti-reports um, uh, and research in a specific way. Um, so the whole wave, you don't need to go to school to be an entrepreneur has, it, and it's, it's not a, it's, it's, it has its place, but the idea that if you, if you haven't gone to school, you shouldn't engage researchers and thinkers, um, I think it's problematic because as an entrepreneur, you're on the go and you're constantly um, troubleshooting. And we've realized all of us within this pandemic, what reflective practice can do. It helps you recalibrate, re-strategize. And so hopefully, whilst this pandemic is giving you pause to look at the, the kind of tool sets that you need, the kind of opportunities around, it should also let you look at who are the, the partnerships and collaborations that you need with folks who have created local research. Um, specific, specifically, you mentioned that within our universities, when, when you look at a lot of the ecosystem, whether it's co-working spaces and others, how many of them are intentionally plugged in with students that have committed five to 10 years of their lives as research? Mm -hmm. But in the UK, the United States, these interventions, the business practices, the policy, the identification of local opportunities, they're intrinsically tied into these universities and schools. That's why they were built, not just for handing certificates. So if you're an entrepreneur and listening into it, have a relationship with folks who are researching in your specific topic, odds are they would find the nuance and in indigenous innovation before foreigners come in, come pay for it and own it. And then you're trying to compete with a larger group than others. Um, and then the second part, the, the, the most important one, it ties into the idea of advocacy and scaling up. I think individually and, and 
I've been in the entrepreneurial race for about a decade. You get caught up in trying to do as much as you can because it's easier for you to go very fast by yourself. Um, yes, you can start to get people to help on certain things, but we don't prioritize collaborative success as a collective, as an industry. And we've reached a space where we need industries in order to have their feet. And that comes from uh, difficult negotiations, but mutually beneficial collaborations. And we cannot skip on that. So this idea that we don't have, I mentioned Tema, for example, this idea that we don't have a collective pushing for industry. We talk about fourth industrial revolution. I'm still yet to hear about that coming from, from specific spaces that is the industrial com like capital since Ghana has had its independence. I'm just like, wait a minute, where did, we where did we miss it? And if they are, why hasn't it been unearthed enough so that we can share it with other entrepreneurs? So that's an example. And that speaks to health, um, that speaks to education, yeah. ed tech as well, education technology, having entrepreneurs in that space, advocate, speak up to it, and partner with government sources so that whatever is happening in market is quickly adopted during these times. Um, because I think there's going to be a huge gap for the next year, year and a half with the learning journeys of a lot of students, mm. um, but we still haven't figured it out. And it's global. It's a global problem. But I'm sure that if we if we pan it into both entrepreneurs and academics and folks with pedagogy, we can co collectively come up with a solution as, a, uh, um, as an industry. Yeah, that's, that's great. So more working groups, really. Um, Thank you both so much for your time. It's been really, really great having you both on the panel. Appreciate that. Um, shall I encourage those of you that are listening to um, connect with Emmanuel and Amma? I'm sure they're on the usual channels, um, LinkedIn being one. Um, and also tune in on Emmanuel's podcast, Unpacking okay, Africa. Yeah. Um, broaden your horizons and your mind and Amma of course um, is doing many amazing things um, and I'm sure she'll be able to um, share with you what's going on with her if you want to connect with her on, on LinkedIn. Um, thank you to the In for Africa Alliance and for those um, at Equitas who um, curated today and um, thank you so much for listening. Take care everybody. <laughs>